Are there any questions about that? I saw one student uh, Wednesday, I guess it was, who was uh, who said, that's funny, I did four measurements in a row and each one was closer than the one before. And that's consistent with the idea of having a rather long time constant to get to 8-bit accuracy. So you need five time constants. You need five time constants to get to 8-bit accuracy. e to the minus 5 is about 0 .006 something. How many time constants do you need to get to get do you need to get to 10-bit accuracy? Who, who, who calculated that out? Guess. Eight. Maybe seven. Because time constants are factors of 2.7 and, and bits are factors of two, so you just sort of, you know, doing it by eye, you say they're equal. So, seven or eight time constants. Any other questions about the v changing v ref? So it Jeremy. takes a few time constants for it to level out, but does it really matter that much since you're just kind of looking at the LCD and it's only updating so fast anyway? Oh, yeah. so, <laughs> right, that, so if it, if it changed over, uh, 20 milliseconds and you're updating the LCD five times a second, who cares? Right, exactly. It doesn't, probably doesn't matter then. Where it does matter is if you wrote your code so that it measures once and then stops. Okay. You don't want to do that. That's not acceptable for this lab. Re re right, real digital voltmeters do not require a button press to take a measurement. They, they continuously, they continuously sample. Right? And so you need to sample your input at least five times a second. At the LCD update rate, I'd suggest actually maybe doing it a little more. Then you could do averaging. If you did it ten times as fast, you could average ten samples together. And how much would that increase the signal to noise ratio, assuming uncorrelated uh, Gaussian white noise? Remember this from statistics class? Statistics of signals? If you make n measurements, how much do you improve the signal to noise ratio? Nobody remembers this? Square root of n? Sound familiar? Oh my. Maybe they don't teach that anymore. If you make, if you, maybe it's not true anymore. <laughs> now the nice thing about thermodynamics is it's always true, unconditionally. If you have uncorrelated measurements and you make a bunch of them and you're estimating a mean, the more you make the better you know the mean, you believe, right? right? And in fact, the standard deviation of the mean goes down as the square root of the number of measurements. So. So if you, were to, if you were to average together 10 measurements on the A to D converter, that would give you about a factor of three or about a bit. Give you one bit more accuracy. Might be worth doing. Don't have to do that. It's not required for this lab. But it's an interesting thing to think about. <clears throat> so, any questions on lab two? Now, I, I wrote up half of the scan code last time, which was setting the ports on and off to get the key code. But then I didn't write the part that does the table match to find out the button number. Now, that's really straightforward C. There's nothing fancy about it. Can I skip it, or do you want to see it written out on the board? Skip. skip? I got to vote for skip. I tap dance on the lectern. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you want that? No, no. <laughs> that would be that would be frightening. <laughs> because 
I weigh enough, it's hard to keep all parts of my body in phase. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> all right, so instead what I'll do is I'll talk about uh, uh, putting the ADC to sleep for more accuracy, or putting the CPU to sleep for more ADC accuracy, and as part of this example, I uh, used Pavel's suggestion of a, a, an improved way of printing floats, which is to try not, not to bother to link up this ungodly uh, library that takes so much space, but instead to use a function call from standard lib, stdlib, that includes a function with the name d-t-o-s-t-r-f, d2 string float. And it takes the float as input and returns the string equivalent as output. And then you just use a, a print percent %s to print it. So I'll, I'll do those two things instead. So what you have to do to get full 10-bit accuracy with this A to D converter is to get rid of as much of the digital noise as you possibly can. <clears throat> the CPU is making a phenomenal amount of 5-volt noise. Have you scoped the power supply leads yet? on the microcontroller? Try that. Uh, or look at the, hook up the A to D converter input line to your circuit and then put an oscilloscope on, the, on that line and see how much pulse noise there is on it. There's probably millivolts, probably tens of millivolts, maybe hundreds of millivolts of noise. So most of it's coming from the clock, which is synchronous throughout the chip. So if you were to turn off the clocks, as many clocks as possible, you could reduce the noise. Now, there's a couple of problems with this. One is, all the timers stop. You know, oh dear. <clears throat> and they're going to stop for about 100 microseconds. Now, you can compensate for that as long as you don't need precision timing, as long as you're not running a real-time clock off of, the, off of the clock sources. And so your task timers will probably be OK. So you now, so if you if you put the CPU to sleep, it there's actually five different sleep modes I believe, but ADC sleep turns off all the clocks and leaves only the ADC running and the external interrupts and timer two, I think. Anything else? Can't remember. And so you get significantly better noise, and you could expect to get 10-bit accuracy. So now let's just uh, write this out. I'm going to need 10-bit result. So by the way, this is now linked up on lab two. The code is on lab two as of this morning. We need a volatile int, uh, a in and a in low, and a float f l o a t. We're going to float voltage, and we're going to have a character v string which is going to be the string equivalent of voltage and we're going to give this uh, a size of about 10 characters it should be sufficient next thing we're going to do is to write an interrupt service routine which takes the CPU out of sleep because once the CPU is in sleep the only way it can get out of sleep is through an interrupt. It's dead. It's snoozing. It's not executing code until an interrupt hits. So we're going to write an interrupt service routine, which is for ADC vect. And this is the ADC done vector. So when the conversion is complete, the hardware, the ADC hardware, throws an interrupt. And in the interrupt, we can, first of all, we can guarantee that the conversion is done so we don't have to check for it. 
So we just read out the interrupt. So if we re always read the low byte first of the A to D converter. And I'm going to cast the uh, A, D, C low to an int. Then we're going to read, then we're going to form A in as int A, D, C high plus A in low. Nope. That's wrong. That's stupid. It's got to be in ADC high times 256. And then we're going to say that A in is going to equal A in plus A in low. So that forms a 16-bit version of AN, but it's never going to be bigger than 10 bits, obviously. Yep. Is there a you that you want to No. You do, yeah. It's a good idea to put this in its own line so that, uh, so that it is clearly read first. But these two lines could be combined. And. Now main main just sets up AD mux to be zero, which is to say we're not doing the left adjust. There's no left adjust. We're re re we're re we're reading channel 0 and we're using the external VREF. That's what AD mux equals 0 means. So it's external source, no left adjust, channel 0. Jumper on. Therefore, the, the STK500 jumper must be mounted. And then we're going to set the ADCS RA, the control register, to enable, of course, the A to D converter. And we have to turn on, and now we're going to turn on the AD interrupt with ADIE, analog to digital interrupt enable. And, of course, we have to prescale by 128. Now, a register you've never seen before, the SMCR. This is the sleep mode control register. And we're going to choose, yeah? Uh, two questions. Going back to uh, the AC stuff, um, is it, what would happen if you just said AM is AC? Will it do the right thing? I don't know. Many, many, many of the registers do that. Many of the, re for instance, timer one does that, and I've had trouble with the ADC. So, it may well be the compiler changes from year to year. It's worth a try. If it works, it works. I can't tell you. We're going to choose mode SM zero. You just have to look it up, right? This is this this is this is ADC sleep. Then of course we have to init init the uh, uh, UART init. And do the other blah stuff that we have to do. Uh, we have to set standard out equal to some stuff, and I'm not going to bother to do that. Then we're going to do an F print F of some starting message. 
just to show stuff is running. But then we have to do an odd thing. And the odd thing is that we have to we have to make sure that the printf completes before the very next thing we're going to do microseconds later which is put the CPU to sleep and you say to yourself why should you have to do that because after all if printf is a synchronous call it does not return until it's done but it's done when it loads the last character into the transmit buffer of the UART. The transmit buffer is not empty for a while. About a millisecond per character. That's a millisecond is, is uh, 16,000 cycles. You have a long time to go someplace. If you put the CPU to sleep in the middle of a transmit, it turns off the transmit clock. And therefore, you get half a character. And it will not be what you expect. It took me about four hours to debug this because I wasn't thinking asynchronously. So what you have to do is right after, if the next thing within two milliseconds, within two milliseconds, if you're going to put the CPU to sleep, you must make sure that the UCSR0A, this is the control status register for the UART, registers a zero, or registers a one rather, on the UDRE0. UDRE0 bit, UDRE0 bit. When the UDR goes high, that means you are data register empty. That means it's transmitted everything that it started to transmit everything that you need to transmit. One millisecond after that, the transmit will actually be done. So here, you have to put a delay millisecond one. That's an OK use. Now we're going to do a sleep enable. You have to separately enable sleep just so that you never accidentally put the CPU to sleep. So there's a series of bits that have to be set to lock out sleep unless you really, really want it to go to sleep. Then we set in interrupts. And you will always turn on interrupts if you enable sleep. Because if you don't, the first time it goes to sleep, it's asleep forever. Well, sure, then it'll come back up and it'll, it'll redo the... And it'll, yeah, it, it, because cycling the power forces a power on reset, and power on reset by default turns off interrupts and, and turns off sleep modes. And in fact, it clears all the registers. So now we go into the endless measurement loop, and the first thing we're going to do is to sleep underscore CPU. Oops, that's a function. At this point, execution of main stops. Hangs here. Hangs here until the ADC finishes. Wait a minute, who started the ADC? Turns out there's some automatic behavior. If you choose, if you choose sleep mode equal to ADC sleep and you sleep the CPU, it auto starts the A to D converter. Okay, so there's no other reason you'd want to put this to sleep 
in ADC mode unless you wanted to start the converter, and so it does. So when we sleep the CPU, it starts the ADC, and nothing else happens until the, until the interrupt service routine completes and exits. So by the time we get to the next line of code, A in is valid with a new measurement. So the reason why we said that SMCR is when we call sleep CPU in those work, which type of sleep uh -huh. it will enter in, right? Yes. Okay. So here we can say voltage is equal to float of A in. And of course, I could be a little clever about this, and but I'll, I won't be. Volt is equal to volt divided by 1024.0 because it's a 10-bit conversion times a ref. In this case, it's just 5.0. Then we're going to use the float to string conversion. D T O D two S T R F. I oh, hate that uh, voltage. So it's going to take this float as an input. It's going to format a six character string with three decimal points, decimal places visible. Six character string, three decimal places, and it's going to put it in V string. Next thing we do is a print F quote percent S percent S V string otherwise it doesn't know what to do percent S V string this does a string conversion of a string that's easy and puts it out on the UART. Then we'll do a, just for debugging, do a printf quote space percent D backslash N backslash R quote A in so we can look at the raw bits coming off the A to D converter. Then, once again, we must do a while bang UCSR0A and UDRE0 Delay millisecond one and then end and then end, this being the while loop. And we have to put this here because the next time it goes through the loop, which will be in just a few microseconds, we are going to sleep the CPU again and we have to be done with this printf and empty the UD uh, empty the transmit buffers. Before, before we get to that point, yeah. Blank. I don't know how else to make a blank. So can you explain what to use for that delay? One millisecond. One character. One millisecond. Ninety-six hundred baud. I mean, if it's already empty, why you have to wait another one? Because the UDR, it's a double buffered system. 
the UDR indicates when the top of stack is empty and but the bottom of stack is still transmitting so it needs one more millisecond after that if you slow down the baud rate you have to make this more than a millisecond The baud rate is configured in UART.C. Okay. And it's 9600 by default. Yes, you can go change that constant, of course. Okay. Right. How long is the CPU usually asleep for? Uh, eight hours is a good time. It, may, it feels awake, feeling rested. <laughs> <laughs> no, you mean, you mean for ADC sleep? Yes. Okay, it depends on the prescaler. And whether or not you've changed the uh, reference or not because because remember a if you change the channel the MUX channel or the reference source it takes 25 cycles to do a conversion 25 cycles at 125 kilohertz per uh, cycle rate <coughs> is going to be what uh, uh, 200 microseconds or so so your push button test is going to be running about 30 milliseconds right. and this is going to take about a fifth of a millisecond okay. probably okay. shouldn't matter okay. however you don't have to do the ADC sleep for this I, I tried to arrange the error budgets for lab 2 so that you could just do an 8-bit measurement without doing without putting the ADC to sleep. <clears throat> so this is just kind of a, a full, full metal jacket way of using the ADC. Uh, you don't necessarily have to use it for this lab. <clears throat> I guess if I was going to do this more than about once per, per uh, or more than twice per uh, per program I would write a little function called something like you are really done <laughs> or you are empty or something so that you can so that you you know that it's really finished there's lots of other ways of using the ADC let's say that you were doing signal processing let's say that you wanted to read a sample let's say at 8 kilohertz Let's say you're doing voice. You want to digitize voice at 8 kilohertz. You're going to want to read a sample at 8 kilohertz and then process it and maybe spit it back out at 8 kilohertz. That would suggest that you should trigger the ADC inside of a timer interrupt service routine so that you have a known sample rate rather than letting the ADC free run or doing something else because it's hard to do DSP if you don't know the sample rate and in this scheme it's just completely free running it'll go as fast as it can go but you're not sure how fast that is <clears throat> any questions about this how about that keypad how's that going any problems with the keypad? All right, we need to talk more about the keypad in the context of lab three. So I guess we can start on that now. So in lab, lab two, the keypad is pretty much used to detect single buttons scale up, scale down, choose a mode, but there's no sort of string number entry kind of operation where you need to enter four or five characters and then tell the CPU that you're done with the entry. And In lab three there will be, <clears throat> so let me talk about lab three just a little bit so you have some sort of more global context. Lab three is to build a synthesizer. So you're going to have to build a sequencer that chooses a set of notes to play, musical notes, 
and then a synthesizer that fabricates those notes and puts them out through the D to A converter. So you're going to, and one of the things that suspect in the lab is that you are going to be able to set the synthesis parameters from the keypad. So you have to be able to enter numbers, like frequency. Well, maybe that's a bad choice since presumably you're going to play a uh, some sort of scale. Oh, but so let me see if I can remember this. The uh, the synthesizer is going to be an FM synthesizer. Oh, I guess I'll, I'll just I'll just say it. I won't write it out just yet. The synthesizer is going to produce a fundamental sine wave. The fundamental sine wave is going to be at uh, standard musical frequencies, middle A, or uh, A above middle C, 440 hertz, and so on. And so the system will be tuned to some sort of reasonable scale. I'm going to ask you to default to a pentatonic scale, unless you're better at music than I am, which probably most of you are. Um, but um, pentatonic is easy to make sound good because most notes sound good next to each other. Uh, but they should be on a standard scale. So th there's going to be a set of fundamental frequencies which are produced by direct digital synthesis. And in the scheme we're using, you'll be able to tune direct digital synthesis to a fraction of a hertz. So you could be right on. You could be within easily within a cycle of the right frequency. But on top of this, on top of this fundamental, which is chosen by scale, you're going to then uh, do, do something to make the system a little more musical than just sounding like cheesy sine wave bursts, right? First of all, turning on a sine wave like this and turning it off again sounds horrible. Because, why? The edges here, first derivatives, discontinuities in the first derivative always results in a spectrum that goes as 1 over n squared. You need to know that rule for cocktail party conversation. <clears throat> and that means that this is no longer a pure sine wave, but has a high frequency component associated with these discontinuities, which means you hear clicks. It clicks when it turns on, it clicks when it turns off. It's very annoying and nasty. So at the very minimum, and oh yes, real instruments, when you play them, typically have some dynamics. If you pluck a string, boring, then you get the maximum energy at the beginning. And so you have a waveform that comes up rather rapidly and decays. On the other hand, if you're playing an instrument which is strongly that has a high Q, has a low loss per cycle, like a tuba. How long does it take for a tuba note to build up? Who plays a tuba? Anybody play a tuba? It takes quite a while, 250 milliseconds or so, to get, that, to get the energy up. And so blown instruments tend to have a waveform that looks like this. So you're going to need to not only produce the fundamental through direct digital synthesis, you're going to need to impose an envelope on the signal so that it increases gradually and decreases gradually, more or less gradually, depending on what instrument you want to simulate. And you're going to have to figure out one of, there's at least three different methods for producing a more complex sound. One is Fourier synthesis. You know the fundamental. Therefore, you know the second harmonic, the third harmonic, and so on. You add them up with different time constants, and you can make something that sounds like a string or an oboe or whatever you want. It has to work that way. It's mathematically complete. It may take a lot of arithmetic to do it, but it works. And you probably already know that method, right, from some other class, you know, about Fourier synthesis. You look up the power, you look up the power spectrum as a function of time of a, of a guitar, and you write a formula that models it. Another, another way to do things is by filtering. It's subtractive synthesis. 
you take, a, you take some sort of nasty high frequency wave like a square wave and you filter it into something more mellow. Another possibility is my favorite, my personal favorite, is FM modulation where you, you don't put out exactly the fundamental but rather you vary its frequency as a function of time around the average frequency which is the note you want to play. And for the cost of two direct digital synthesis units, one for the fundamental and one for the FM modulation, you can make a huge variety of sounds, including things like drums and, and blown instruments and cymbals and all kinds of stuff. So what I'm going to ask you to do is the fundamental, the fundamental direct digital synthesis is the frequency is going to be set, but the, fr but the modulation frequency, the FM modulation frequency, uh, is variable. Are we using fixed point for this? Of course! Okay. You can't possibly do this in floating yeah. point at 8 kilohertz. You just have to be clever with the fixed point okay. to minimize multiply times mostly. And so there's all kinds of, of uh, I, I would qualify them as just pure ugly tricks mm -hmm. that you do, and I'll go through them uh, to to form the envelope. The other thing is, okay, oh, envelope. You want a nice exponential decay. Uh, strings, everything else go exponentially, very close to exactly exponentially. Uh, if you have energy build up through a through a blown system, it tends to increase exponentially and then decrease exponentially when you stop blowing, start blowing, stop blowing. And so you need to be able to generate exponentials cheaply. Oh, EXP takes way too long. You could do a table lookup, of course, but there's an easier way. And that's to simulate the first order equation that generates exponentials. You simulate an RC circuit for each different RC that you want to produce. Right? RCs give exponential rises and decays. So you just simulate an RC circuit. And the interesting thing is you can do this with one, multiple, with one add and one shift per time, per time step. So you can do it very quickly indeed. You can afford to do dozens of them. And therefore you can make quite complicated envelopes for your, for your music. You're doing uh, you're doing pulse width modulation output at 62 kilohertz. So the so the 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 output of this thing will be a we'll use one of the timers in PWM mode. It's a mode we haven't yet talked about at all. PWM mode. When you put a timer into PWM mode, you completely disable all of its other functions, including compare match, overflow, and everything else. It doesn't do any of those anymore. In PWM mode, it only produces a pulse width modulated signal at constant frequency. The highest PWM frequency you can generate on the CPU is, is uh, F clock over 256 which for a 16 megahertz clock is 62,500 hertz. That's above your hearing so you don't have to worry about hearing the, mod the, the carrier. So pulse width modulation at constant frequency suggests that the modulation is going to look like this. A low voltage Let's say that you want, to, you want to model the bottom of a sine wave, the dip of a sine wave. You want to model a low voltage is going to be produced, is going to be modeled as the, as the PWM output by a low duty cycle PWM signal. The top of the sine wave, higher voltage, is going to be modeled by the same frequency the same frequency but more high voltage. 
And the way you're going to reconstruct the analog signal is to take this PWM signal and put it through a low pass filter with a time constant greater than 1 over 62,000 hertz and smaller than the time constant you need to reproduce your signal. Now it turns out the speakers we use have a very adequate low pass characteristic internally. They don't reproduce 62 kilohertz at all. And so you don't even have to build this. You can just hook the PWM output to the cheesy speakers we have and it sounds pretty good. Now, however, empirically one finds, since I've been trying to do this lately, that if you take the same pulse width modulator output and hook it into say wind sound input on a computer, the, the mic input on a computer, it sounds terrible because the bandwidth of that input is 22 kilohertz and you start getting beat frequencies between the 65 kilohertz and the 22 kilohertz and so the signal instead of sounding like music sounds like constantly it's horrible there you do have to do actual low pass filtering analog low pass filtering to get rid of the high frequency components so the overall I'm going to go through this in of course hideous detail but the overall idea is you're going to use direct digital synthesis. You can look that up today. You can do a, you're going to use direct digital synthesis to produce FM sine waves, or you're going to use additive synthesis or subtractive synthesis. Your choice. Do anything you want. You're going to be partly graded. Some fa fraction of the grade is going to be dependent upon how many independent voices musical voices you can produce. How many different notes can you sound at the same time? I know you can do at least six. Yes. So, uh, more about the filtering stuff. Uh, if you're doing a complex filtering step, won't that reduce <coughs> the number of voices? <coughs> complex filtering step, uh, you mean at the output of the PWM yeah, output? Well, yes, it will. Yes, it will. Now, the PWM output has to be actual analog filtering. This is outboard from the chip. But you're talking about shaping the signal by means of... Uh, 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 yes, you absolutely will take lots of cycles to do subtractive synthesis. However, if you go to the DSP page, which is linked off of Lab 3, you will find I wrote some pretty fast DSP stuff for this chip. It's not blindingly fast but it's pretty fast. If I had my choice of the three methods, I would not use subtractive synthesis. I might use additive synthesis, might use FM. It depends on how your brain works. With FM, you're going to have to do some trial and error because it's really hard to predict what something is going to sound like from the FM modulation characteristics. Using, using additive synthesis, you can look it up and write it down. So, but that brings up an interesting thing. So, the, the, the waveform for a string, guitar string, more or less falls like this. But it's not quite that simple because at short times, the power spectrum, so at short time, after plucking, the power spectrum of, of a string looks like this. This is the fundamental, this is the second harmonic, this is the third harmonic. The second harmonic is quite a lot louder than the first harmonic. At a long time, at a long time, the first harmonic is louder and the second and third and fourth and fifth harmonic are much quieter and in fact they drop off as pr approximately one over the frequency. So, you, if you want to make a string kind of sound, then you have to not only take into account the spectrum at a short time, but the spectrum at a long time and smoothly go between those. Otherwise, it won't sound like a string, it'll sound like something else. 
There is an algorithm which does this embarrassingly easy, easily. It's called Carpless Strong. It also is rather efficient on an 8-bit microcontroller. In fact, it was originally designed for an 8-bit microcontroller in 1985 by a guy named Kevin Carpless, who happened to be a faculty member at Cornell. But then he moved to Stanford and patented it. <coughs> oh, well. And got, along with a guy named Julius O. Smith. If, you, if you're interested in electronic music, Go, uh, Google up Julius O. Smith. His website is fabulous. It is full of interesting information about synthesis and analysis of music. But the Carpless Strong algorithm is a good way of synthesizing string-like sounds. So let's say for this thing you wanted to do a, uh, a string quartet. Then you could, you could, you could use uh, uh, four Carpless Strong units running on this box. I know that one group did a six string guitar in real time at eight kilohertz using Carpless Strong and it sounds really good. If you go back and look at, I think it's called Air Jam. It's one of the final projects. Look up Air Jam and listen to it. It's, it really sounds, it sounds like a, a, a steel string guitar that's being plucked with a hard fingernail. It has a lot of high frequencies at the beginning because the initial state of the string is white noise. It's highly excited at high frequencies and then decays after that according to the wave equation. But the cool thing is the wave equation is solved using only a delay line and an averager. Ooh. That's the clever part. So that's the overview. I, I expect to hear some pretty interesting things out of Lab 3. It could also become part of a final project easily. Particularly if I'm going to ask you to do a Markov sequencer for Lab 3. We'll talk more about that. I want it to be a constrained random process. But if you were to add some learning to it, that'd be fun for a final project. or incorporate some musical intelligence into it, which I don't have, but you might, then that might be an interesting final project. Any questions about Lab 2 or Lab 3? We'll start talking next time about how do you not only debounce the keypad, but in the same state machine, form a string. So we want to debounce and form string at the same time, so we can say 3.14 enter. So what do we have here? We have three minutes. Final projects for three minutes. Seventy-five dollars enough? No. <laughs> yes, no. Why is it not enough? If I do the EEG, the EEG alone is a hundred dollars. We can't do that then. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Unless, well, okay, so somebody else said no. What's, your, uh, what's the complaint over here? Who, who said no? I don't even know who it was. Nobody's going to fess up, huh? <laughs> so, I mean, the reason I'm asking is a very serious question. And that is that there's a significant rate of inflation every year. I don't change these numbers very often. Is it time to change the number? When's the last time you changed it? Oh, I don't know, three years ago? It used to be uh, $50. But I, I bumped it to 75 because there were so many tears. <laughs> Uh, but maybe it's time to bump it again. Now, 75 doesn't sound like so much anymore. It's half of a textbook. And so it, it's not like it's a, it's a, it's a heavy load, uh, although uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to encourage people to spend a lot of money instead of thinking. <clears throat> but ask yourself this carefully. Is it time to raise? You don't have to answer me today. I'll take, uh, you know, comments and email. We could talk about it Monday. Not less than 10 page treaties on why it should be. Yeah. Okay. See you in lab.